this lecture is on starting our unit on theater, which for our purposes consists of opera, musical theater, we know listen to one, and ballet, several of those. <clears throat> and uh, opera starts in the Baroque period, 1600 to 1750. So the most important new genre of the Baroque era was opera, which we've already mentioned, a large scale music drama that combines poetry, acting, scenery, and costumes with singing and instrumental music. This is a grand composition, a grand event. The principal components of opera include the orchestral overture, which we start with, the curtain is down, and then during the opera, we have solo arias, which are lyrical songs and recitatives. And you needed to be able to distinguish or at least know the difference, the meaning of the two different styles, recitative or an aria. And then uh, ensemble numbers, including the chorus where everybody sings, or sometimes it's groups, twos or threes, fours, whatever. The text of an opera is called a libretto. The earliest opera libretti, there you go, plural, were based on mythology, epic poetry, and ancient history. And the person who writes the libretto, the libretto is the librettist. Henry Purcell wrote Dido and Aeneas, an opera based on the Aeneid, a Roman epic by Virgil. It's a poem, that's what it is. It's an epic is the closing lament by Dido is a powerful expression of grief that reflects contemporary ideals about womanhood. And we'll sample, sample that. And Henry Purcell, before we even go any further, that's we mentioned him when we listened to the Benjamin Britten because his piece was uh, variations and fugue on the theme of Henry Purcell, the same Henry Purcell here. So how did we get to this invention of opera, right? We says that the Renaissance was looking back to the Greeks. And here I wrote that ironically, and maybe counterintuitively, new technology actually encourages and facilitates the study of the past. And those of you who are scientists or uh, geologists, you know, all the discovery that's been made from uh, aerial surveys, with different types of cameras or um, meters to measure the, the soil. And they are able to tell, you know, where people lived a thousand years ago and uh, things that you can't see if you're on the ground. Here's a, that's a perfect example of uh, using technology to look back and find out a lot of information. There is a precedent for this, right? In the centuries after the printing pr printing press was invented, recently we discovered plays from the ancient world began to be disseminated throughout Europe because they were printed and sold, helping to spark an explosion of theater in the Renaissance. So this is the time of Shakespeare and Elizabeth I, and this is a very popular uh, entertainment theater, and then to try and study and figure out how the Greeks did it is uh, how they come up with the idea of opera and really madrigals too. An opera is a stage play set to music, a spectacle that combines scenery, action, literary drama, and continuous or almost continuous music into a whole that is greater than its parts. It's big time entertainment. So Monody, the Greeks, the, the people from the uh, Venice, the Profound Thinkers Club, Florentine Camerata was their name. And they looked at the Greeks and they said, how did they play their, perform their plays? And so they, they came to the conclusion, which we agree now, that they sang their parts. They just didn't recite them. Solo singers, that's what Monody is. And it has... Uh, an accompaniment with the basso continuo, and we talked about that, which uses figured bass numbers to tell the two players, a bass player and a chordal player, or it could be one if it's an organ, 
or a, a grand lute, which we heard in that um, the uh, Strozzi, Barbara Strozzi. And so monody is also in a declamatory style, the forcefulness. You're really, you know, powerfully saying something. So let's listen to this is an overture by Monteverdi, and we listened to a madrigal that he had composed. And remember, Monteverdi was one of those individuals who lived in the Renaissance and also in the Baroque. So here he's writing, uh, when he wrote the madrigal, that was that we sampled that, that was from the Renaissance. Now I'm gonna show you his composition, which is um, an overture to the opera Orfeo from 1607, the first great opera. The things that you can listen for is the tonality. This is the difference between the, the um, Renaissance or some differences where they had a lot of polyphony. And here you'll hear the same chord played for a long time, this this overture. And it's just like the chord is stated, bam. And then you hear about it, then it's like, bam. This is different than Renaissance where you had a lot of uh, um, movement with harmony because of the polyphony. Again, the, one of the harmonic changes, an example of the harmonic changes that take place between the Renaissance and the Baroque. And also notice that there's the basso continuo. You can see it right here. Here is the uh, chordal instrument. You can't see that. And here is the, the bass instrument, which is a lute. Let's sample this. is an overture. Now from the same opera, an example of monody here, it's to say morta, you are dead, basically, he says. So the, the opera, Orfeo, is about a young couple, and actually I think it was performed at a wedding, one of these events that, you know, last five days. And this opera was written by rich, you know, it was paid for by a rich man, and it was written for the celebration of the wedding. But the storyline is a young couple is married and the wife is out picking flowers with her maidens and she gets bitten by a snake. And this is like, you know, very shortly after they're, they're newlyweds and she dies. So the whole story is in, in it, then he is exclaiming his, his emotional response to it that we're going to hear now because he hears that she is dead. And the whole story continues on that he tries to get her to make a deal with the underworld to come back to to life, and, and he's not supposed to look back. It's that story we've heard before. Anyway, uh, this is an example of monody. One person singing in a declamatory style and accompanied by a basso continuo. Partita, 
me partita per mai più, mai più non tornare, e Dio rimango. Alcuna cosa ponno, non andrò sicuro ai più profondi abissi. Pentere rito il cor del re dell'ombra. Ecco tra notti a rivedere le stelle. You can literally feel his pain. So the components of opera, one more time, a little bit more detail, is the most important new genre of the Baroque period, of, of all modern, forever, <laughs> 1600 to 1750, big, a big change in music style. And of course, it's a drama, and it has, again, scenery, acting, poetry, music, costumes, smoke bombs, waterfalls, you name it, whatever you can think of, of using always about strong emotions through music. The principal components of an opera, and these are the same components of all the operas we're going to sample from here on in, and uh, that are written today, use these same components. So if you want to know about opera, this will not change. And once you learn it, you'll know it forever about opera. So we have a recitative, which is in this declamatory style. And actually the example we heard by Orfeo singing is a, a recitative. And the first operas only had recitatives. They did not have arias. But later on, it became the common practice to have a recitative always followed by an aria. And uh, the big difference between the recitative and the aria is the recitative is basically telling you uh, about the storyline and what's happening. The aria is about how I feel about what's happening. You know, so the first part tells you that the mailman comes and she falls in love with the mailman. And then the next one is she's singing about why she loves the mailman. So that's the difference between a recitative and aria. Recitative, more like in a recited type of style and the aria in these beautiful flowing melodies. That's also a big difference between recitative and aria. Time doesn't move in, in the aria, but it this is advances the plot. And again, we have duets, trios, quartets. Sometimes it's speaking without singing, depending on the type of opera. And sometimes there was music performed between the scenes, right? You change what's happening on the stage with the curtain down. An aria is like an air. And I've told you that before, many words that just mean song. An air is a tune or a melody. An air is an accompanied song or melody dating from Elizabethan or Jacobean England, 1560, 1625. So at the same time, airs were popular in England. And so they were popular all places perhaps and and it is uh, really an example of monody also regarding operatic aria a lengthy substantial and very often a complex piece of vocal music in which the essential character and dramatic information is transmitted via the music itself unlike a recitative in which the words carry the expressive message in an operatic aria it is the music that carries the expressive message Arias were used for reflection, for character development, for the expression of feeling. During an aria, time stops and reflection begins. You know, sing about why did they do that? I wish I hadn't done that. Why did she do this to me? That kind of a thing. An opera performance at the uh, theater in Rome, 1729. So this is right in the Baroque period as portrayed by Paninini, a painter of the time. So I think this is as good as a photograph, perhaps, huh? maybe with some uh, personal interpretation in here. But look at the size of this. All these box seats all around and all the people up here. 
I don't see where the, oh, the orchestra is up here. And this lavish, lavish scenery and the stage. Of course, there's no electricity, right? There's no running motors. There's no air conditioning. So it must have been really quiet if people were quiet. And then the lighting, can you imagine? Uh, it must have been dark. These are all candles. How did they light these things? And how long would they stay lit? People up here too? Wow, amazing. The growth of opera. So we really believe that it started in Italy. We, we talked about that, the Florentine Camerata. And the first one we sampled was from a wedding, a royal wedding. Monteverdi wrote, I think, three, maybe five operas, but we only have three. Two were lost. And shortly, opera moved from just being for rich people in uh, in a palace, it became everybody wanted to go to the opera. And if you could afford a ticket, you went. This was entertainment. Again, no TV, no radio, no phone. You know, let's, let's get out and do something. And I think the first opera house was not till 1637. I've seen another slide. In different countries, it, it was... Um, a little different, a little different. In England, they called it a mask. And this is curious, I find, that right in the middle of the Baroque here, the government that was in power, it was forbidden by Puritans to attend theater. If the theater was an opera, they said it was a concert, so it was okay. So they, the Puritans were not permitted to go to the theaters but they could go to operas. So what do you think musicians did? Well, they wrote more operas. An important form in the Baroque period is variations. Variations is pretty much exactly what it says. You have something and then you change it and you change it again and you change it again, but it still has a connection to the original. Those musical forms are processes that are based on an ongoing process of variation. Such a movement will state a theme of some sort after which subsequent sections will vary that theme to some degree or another. Here are some forms that were popular during the Baroque that are based on variations. Pasacalia, a ground bass, a chicone, chicona. And this is important because the piece of music we're gonna to listen to has a ground bass. Here is Henry Purcell. Uh, you know, not 1600 when opera started, like the Monteverdi. So this is already 75 years later after the Monteverdi piece that we sampled just a bit of. And the opera we're going to look at is from 1689. Oh, 89 years later. Well, 782. Dido and Aeneas. And it was first presented in a girls' school in London. Henry Purcell was English. It's based on a Greek story where the sailor, Aeneid, is traveling and doing whatever sailors do and conquering. And he went to Egypt and he fell in love with Dido. They're, they're in love. He's a sailor and his sailors get restless. And so it's like, you know, captain, boss, man. Well, we're sailors. We're waiting for you when you're like with your girlfriend and we need to get on with the show. So he is convinced that they have to leave. And then uh, we're going to sample the one piece where the sailors are waking up and, and are saying, let's go. Let's get out of here. Dido hears of this. And of course, she's depressed and she kills herself. The song we're going to hear is about her dying, Queen of Carthage, major city in Egypt at the time. And then when we watch it, you'll see her uh, 
serving maid is tending to her. It's very emotional and it's an example of monody. She's dying and she's singing about dying. Flames from the funeral pyre light the way for Aeneas's ship. Jeez. Conqueror Aeneas greets Queen Dido of Carthage. It must have been a popular story if this is again during the Baroque. This is the painting from the Baroque. And notice the style. You, you have, there's, you, you can look for uh, movement, right? They're not just standing there. He's holding his hands out. They're doing something. And, uh, you know, the infant is, is, I don't know, is this Cupid must be, right? The arrows. He's ready to take a step. And her assistants got his helmet on. And we have somebody bringing some drinks. Many figures. A lot of busyness, right? The ornate character of things. This is the Baroque style. The form is hornpipe, which is a dance, is the ensemble that sings it, solo voice and men's chorus. And then we'll hear the recitative, Thy Hand Belinda, sung by Dido, accompanied by continual only. So this is definitely modesty. Then Dido sings a recitative and then an aria and the recitative thy hand belinda is very short and she's deciding what she's going to do and so the aria is uh again the recitative she decides what she's going to do and tells us this is what's going to happen and the aria is about how she feels about what's going to happen now this has this descending bass line which is one of those musical elements that was used to often to portray death, a, a descending bass line or a descending music line. So they have the hornpipe. It's in three, right? Da 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 so they're singing about let's go, and it is in English. And then we have this recitative, which is sung by Dido. Thy hand, Belinda, darkness shakes me. Oh, thy bosom, let me rest. More I would, but death invades me. Death is now a welcome guest. And then she sings the aria, which is one of the most beautiful pieces we're going to listen to, honestly. Um, so it has this descending bass line. Da -di -da 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 and it is repeated 11 times the same bass line. And every time the melody is different. So we have this continuity between the bass line is repeated over and over and the music changes as, as she, every time she sings above that same bass line. Let's listen to the sailor's hornpipe from Dido and Aeneas.
and let's listen to Dido's Lament. First, the short recitative, and then the aria, and immediately latch on to the descending bass line, the pasacalia, which is what the form is called.
Handel was born in 1685, 86, about the same time as, as Bach and lived and died about the same time, 1750-ish. But uh, he was a German who studied music in Italy and went to England and was a huge uh, success, a very amazing writer of music composer and a very clever businessman. He first wrote operas and wrote a lots of them. And then as styles changed, we'll talk about later why, and he wrote oratorios, which will, you know, was a sacred music, but it's like an opera with all the same characteristics, except no scenery and no acting basically. And we'll hear his handles the Messiah when we study uh, functional sacred music. Here is a uh, commentary on opera at the time. I think it's kind of eye-awakening. This is opera going in Handel's day was not the sedate, sedate experience it is today. People went to the opera to be seen and to follow the vocal gyrations of a favorite singer. At performances, they would play cards, chat, move around, eat oranges and nuts, spit freely, hiss and yowl at a singer they did not like. The singers themselves would go out of dance, greeting friends in the boxes or talking to one another while they were not singing. Nobody on stage pre pretended to act. A great castrato, and we talked about that, was the vocal wonder of all time, a singing machine. Virtually a musical instrument, even before Handel's time, the castrados were idols. They were spoiled, pampered figures of great wealth and vanity, and even greater eccentricity. They were the first performers in music history to achieve star status. Name implies they were castrated males. Back to antiquity, they did this. And uh, how did this happen? Well, women's voices were not permitted in the Catholic Church. So we wanted that range of voice, and they used boys in place of women's voices. But the problem with boys' voices is they grow up, and then they lose that high range unless you castrate them. Oh, my gosh. We got a plan. Right? The operation took place before puberty. After years of rigorous training, the singers went into the service of the church, having female voices and male lungs. Such was the accomplishment of their singing that they began to appear in public outside of the church. And I have a recording of uh, the last castrati. But anyway, it talks about their uh, amazing voices. Some of them live to be 102 or whatever. Right? Often these singers were physical freaks, oversized fat with barrel chests and skinny arms and legs. But it seems that their sexual life was untouched. Some were homosexuals, others had affairs with women, and a few even married. No children came out of those deals, right? The castrados had a sexless kind of woman's voice. But from all reports, the sound they produced was of exceptional sweetness. One of the vocal tricks that astounded audiences every time was their ability to hold a tone. Some of them could sustain a note for well over a minute. And part of the fun of going to the opera in those days was to cheer an encounter between a castrato and a trumpeter or flutist. All would turn them blue in the face holding on a single note, but the castrato always won. The castrato became extinct, as far as is known, with the death of this man, Moreshi. And he was a member of the Sistine Chapel. Uh, made a few phonograph records. Let's listen to a sample of a castrato. This man, Moreshi. <laughs> Oh! 
And that will end our chapter 22, Introduction to Opera. Henry Persson.